All right, and we're going to get started. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our second event in the series. Wait, you collect what? Diving into the specialty collections that give some of our institutions unique challenges. My name is Stephanie Moore, and I'm your moderator for today's dive into collecting things that go boom. RCWR has some wonderful sponsors, so please allow me to quickly highlight our sponsor for today's event. As one of the nation's oldest and most respected fine arts handlers and shippers, Cook's Crating and Fine Arts Transportation is the company that many of the greatest American museums, galleries, and collectors turn to for their art moving needs. Based in Los Angeles, California, don't forget to contact Cook's Crating for your crating, shipping, installation, and storage needs. If you are not a member of RCWR, please consider joining today. RCWR represents collections professionals in our nine Western states as the current affiliate to the Collection Stewardship Group of AAM. In addition to this webinar series, we have an amazing quarterly newsletter host regional events, and plan an annual community service initiative in conjunction with the Western Museums Association. Membership is only $15 a year, so join today at rcwr.org. Before I introduce our speakers, just a few quick Zoom logistics. This is a Zoom meeting. As you've probably noticed, having the ability to turn on and off your camera and mic. With that, if you don't wanna be on camera, please turn it off. This is especially important as we are recording today's webinar and we'll be sharing it on our RCWR YouTube page in a few days. If you find today's talk useful, don't hesitate to share it with your network. And finally, everyone's mic is muted to start, but don't hesitate to join the conversation either out loud or through the chat when we get to the questions. Today, we are very fortunate to have two speakers who handle weapons a lot in their day jobs. Beth Sanders is a collections manager at the U.S. Naval Undersea Museum in Keyport, Washington. She began her career by focusing on preserving and interpreting prehistoric lithic technologies, but has since found a niche working with military history, mostly Cold War to present, and has been with the Navy for over seven years. She earned her bachelor's degree in anthropology from New York University and her master's degree in anthropology or sorry, her master's degree in material culture and artifact studies from the University of Glasgow. Beth also serves as the vice chair for the Registrar's Committee Western Region when she's not wearing her Navy hat. Kathleen Sliger is the curator and director for the Oregon Military Museum. Prior to taking on this role, she worked with the Oregon Historical Society cataloging and rehousing museum objects. In addition to her professional roles, she has been an Oregon Heritage Commission mentor since the program's inception in 2012, served on the boards for the Oregon Museums Association and the Registrar's Committee Western Region, developed resources pertaining to the care of textile objects for the Oregon Heritage Commission, and taught for two local universities. She holds a BS in Merchandising Management and an MA in Fashion and Textile Studies, history theory museum practice with a focus on textile conservation. And I'll turn it over to you guys. Sorry, the hardest thing is always finding your unmute button when you're in full screen. So, Hi everyone, as Stephanie just said, my name is Beth Sanders. I'm one of the collections managers at the US Naval Undersea Museum uh, in Keyport, Washington. If you are unfamiliar with our super cool museum, we have specialty collections in all the things that the Navy is working on undersea. So diving, submarines, and undersea weapons. So our collection was founded on a torpedo collection. And I do apologize for the dog in the background. He's not associated with the torpedoes. Um, but our, our collection was founded on a torpedo collection because the base that we're right outside the gates of um, did a lot of torpedo manufacturing testing during World War II. So we have over 130 torpedoes in our collection. 
And I've had the opportunity over the last uh, six years at this museum and over seven working for the Navy to learn a lot about managing undersea weapons safely. And then, hello, I'm Kathleen. And uh, sorry if I'm having a bad internet connection today. I do apologize for that. That's partly why you don't get to see my face in the column, but you do right here. But um, I am, uh, let's see, I'm the director of the Oregon Military Museum in Clackamas, and we're just outside of Portland, about 30 minutes from downtown. And we are the official state repository for the state of Oregon for all military history. And so that means we have things from you know little pins and tons of uniforms to things like in this photograph, you know, we have like 20 tanks um, on my inventory. Uh, we have about 14,000 cataloged objects, and I'm guessing that it's going to easily triple that number once everything is out of backlog. But part of that collection is uh, 2,000 federal items. And so I'm kind of a unique beast on this presentation because I am a federal technician, but I also manage um, a state museum. And so I have a lot of uh, exceptions to rule that I get to play around with, uh, but fundamentally speaking, because I have 2000 federal items, I do abide by the Army regulations since we are part of the Army Museum Enterprise. And so I, I choose to raise the level for, for the standard of care for all of my items so that we follow Army regulations for even the state property. But again, I get to pick and choose since, since, uh, since I'm kind of manning both ships here, or manning both tanks maybe actually here. Uh, and then I'm also really lucky because uh, everything in our collection um, was was rendered inoperable and inert prior to my time being there. But I have found that there's little documentation. And so something that you will hear both Beth and I talk about continuously today is the importance of documentation and policies and procedures. And so those are things that I am now implementing and uh, standardizing so that you know there is no further confusion in the future. So before we go in any further, we're kind of curious about the diversity of people that we have joining us today. And so, Stephanie, if you wouldn't mind launching the poll, we were curious to know if you have weapons in your collection. And we'll just take a moment while you guys all fill that in. When we have a good proportion of the respondents, Stephanie, would you share the responses with us? All right, so well over half of us have weapons in our collection. That's probably why you wanted to come today, but also a good chunk of people who either don't have weapons in your collection or um, don't think you do. So another good thing to be here. And I'm very glad to see that a lot of people already have policies addressing weapons in their collections um, and that people are interested in writing them and I will point out for those who say that they're pretty sure they'd never have weapons come into their collection, that I have seen former ordinance in art museums, in natural history museums, in science centers, small local history museums. You know, it's not only military museums. So, you know, there's a lot of different types of things that can be weapons, um, as well as weapons converted into items. So. You know, definitely some things to think about as we go forward with uh, collecting things safely. And on that, today we're going to specifically be focusing on firearms, ordnance, and ammunition. So firearms, small arms, guns, um, ordnance, normally larger arms, but also uh, other uh, explosive devices, cannons, grenades, uh, ammunition, bullets. These are just as explosive as other uh, forms of ordinance and need to be remembered and taken into consideration when you're looking at 
how you're safely storing your collection. But just because those are the three things we're going to be focusing on doesn't mean that you shouldn't be looking at your collection as a whole for other hazards. So we are going to touch a little bit about radioactivity and radioactive artifacts today. And then I wanted to just bring up some other things that are not the focus today, but are definitely hazards. So batteries, you know, a lot of our weapons also have batteries in them. So we have to remove those. Lead acid batteries are highly corrosive and very dangerous to if they um, start disintegrating on you over time. Uh, and then pressurized containers. Well, it is a container of items under pressure. So for us, where we have oxygen tanks, we have a number of those affiliated with diving collections. Um, we actually drill a hole in the tank to release that pressure so that there is no risk of explosion there. Uh, medical kits, a lot of people might not think about medical kits as a potential explosive, but I will never forget the day that I was working at the National Museum of the US Navy and we found a Vietnam era medical kit that had a burn uh, treatment that I learned on that day that this material, when it becomes, uh, when it ages, it actually crystallizes and the crystallized version of the chemical is an explosive that's actually less stable and more explosive than TNT. So we had to call the fire department. They evacuated a large portion of the Washington Navy Yard. Yes, Margaret, uh, picnic acid is what is in that burn cell. Um, and the fire department said, oh, no, no, this isn't us. And they called uh, explosive ordnance disposal to handle this. So some things people don't think about. We also have a lot of collections that have different types of breathing apparatuses. And some of those have oxygen scrubbers that can be that can either explode or be highly corrosive uh, and cause all sorts of hazmat issues. We have spring loaded mechanisms, both in our weapons and in our other uh, artifacts and springs are like a pressurized container. They are under pressure and they are a constant risk. So when you think about how you're going to keep it, if you're keeping something with a spring, is the actual spring mechanism worth the risk to the object itself, other objects around it, uh, and you know yourself and visitors that might be near it? And then even though they don't go boom, edged weapons, definitely something to Think about when you're talking about general weapons policies uh, along the same lines of pilferability and ability for people to use them to do harm. Uh, and then I added trench art, which like folk art, you know, is what I, kind of what I was referencing earlier with the, you might not know it's in your collection because people have turned, especially bullets, but all sorts of material into other objects. And so you have to be on the lookout for times when something has been repurposed and contains a hazardous material inside. All right, so I didn't add this one to the list, but um, Beth really reminded me of just being cautious of how you open things even. So we have a rule at our museum that when you open anything, you open it away from all persons, uh, just in case there is something that is volatile or like the medical kits that have rubber and the rubber fails and then a, a syringe comes popping out of it. So we just have a, a really a really big rule right there that always open things away from people. Um, but in terms of ordnance and small arms, uh, while there are a quick, there are a couple of quick identifiers to determine if some ordnance are safe. Um, you have not been trained to determine that, and so never make an assumption. Always treat a weapon as if it's loaded or it's live. Uh, never point it at anybody, and and never make an assumption that that you have a, a true understanding of it. Uh, the only way that you should be able to handle something safely is after a professional has confirmed that it's been demilled or rendered inoperable. And we'll talk a lot about, um, you know, who you can contact to, to get that done and kind of ways to mitigate this sort of situation throughout this presentation. Uh, always wear gloves. You know, I'm, I'm someone that I'm a, I'm, I have a textile conservation background. And so for me, just washing my hands is what I, I prefer to do and what is important for me. I like to have that tactile experience and be able to understand what I'm, what I'm holding and, and handling. But with weapons, always wear gloves. Not only is that going to protect you from exposure to heavy metals, but that also keeps, uh, you know, 
your oils from transferring onto the object. And, and never never reuse use those gloves. Once you're done with a weapon, throw them away and get a fresh pair. Uh, and you know, find other people with throughout the community that can help you. You know, Beth and I are here today. Our email addresses will be at the you know on the one of the last slides, and and we're here to help. Uh, but that also means that you should be finding people within your community too. Oregon is a really special place, and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, there are a lot of um, different opportunities that we have here for, for specialists. And you might not have that in your state, but that doesn't mean it can't exist and that it shouldn't exist. It just needs to start somewhere. Um, and that could be with you reaching out to us and then becoming that resource in your state. And unfortunately, weapons collections always have a political charge to them. And so always keep in mind that you have to leave politics out of it. What's important is your mission and uh, and, and what your story is. And just know what the state laws are, understand your mission, and have a clear, uh, a clear path forward for how to handle these, uh, these items. Always keep politics out of it. Next slide. So we're going to start with just a little caveat here. We have about an hour this morning. We're going yeah. to get started. We're not going to tell everything about every type of weapons collection uh, that can be. So like Kathleen just said, form your own community. We are happy to be part of that community. And you know, we're just going to try to run through some of the basics of this material this morning, but save up your questions and uh, you know, think about these things and keep building how you handle it. But so getting started, uh, the first thing that I put here is to ask who's in charge. So we're dealing with weapons, whether they are inert ordnance or firearms, there's going to be some sort of requirement for someone to make the ultimate decisions about safety and to be confirming the safety. And once again, it's not us that are going to be the explosive safety experts that we'll bring in other people and we'll talk more about that in a moment, but we need someone who will be making sure that there's one policy, one way forward for your institution to ensure that two people aren't thinking that the other person is doing it. So in my institution, following the Navy's procedure, we actually have a system where there is a designated accountable person and that's the museum director, but they assign someone who is the alternate accountable person and that person is me. So when it comes to explosive safety in our institution, any question comes to me. Any object that's coming in, I'm the one that is going to be making sure that it's safe. And that's not to say I don't work very closely with my colleagues on this and that they can't help if I'm out of the office, but you need to have one person who's making sure that you're going through all the steps that you have set in your institution's policy to deal with these types of objects because they are unique objects. And especially if this is something that you are intending or, or thinking that you're going to have a lot of in your collection, you should have a specific policy and procedure to deal with these types of artifacts from, you know, from acquisition to disposal, because that will take any of the, the question of what do I do now uh, out of it in the moment. You'll go to your procedural document and say, okay, we're talking about lending out something. We're talking about deaccessioning something. And you can easily go back through those documents and say, these are our steps for our institutions. Having learned all the requirements for your governing body, whether it's a federal institution like mine or a state uh, or a local nonprofit. And a lot of this is about making sure that we are minimizing the risk because as collections managers, as registrars, we are always thinking about risk assessments for our artifacts, but these types of artifacts are taking risk assessments to another level, to a level of human safety, um, as with a lot of other hazmat types of artifacts in our collections. But in this photo below, this is our collection storage area. When you have over a hundred torpedoes that you need to store, well, yes, you need custom storage for storing torpedoes, which is a problem most people don't have the ability to get this awesome system as a solution to. But any one of those that was not inert, that was not safe, is a risk to not only itself, every object in our collection, 
our building and of course most importantly the people who are in the building whether it be staff or visitors so any item that is explosive has that huge risk to it and you have to make sure that you are taking control and taking care of that beyond that especially with small arms there's an added pilferability uh risk assessment to to handle and we'll talk more about that as we go on with storage and and display but the same goes for edged weapons as well anything that could be used whether or not it could hurt someone um, if it's not operable it could be used to threaten someone and so that's a risk assessment we have to take into consideration as well considering the storage options for these different types of materials so that's that's kind of your next step if you're thinking about starting to collect weapons are you going to have a custom storage rack for torpedoes because you're planning to have 130 torpedoes in your collection? Or are you looking at a gun safe to have added security for those, for those object types? And so balancing those and figuring out what's right for your institution. Because while well, both Kathleen and I will discuss, you know, Navy for me, Kathleen Army and state levels of responsibility for ordinance collections, because everyone's laws in different states and different regions, um, different pieces of property are all a little bit different, uh, you'll have to set that highest level of responsibility that's right for you. And sorry, I'm thinking of so many things right now. Uh, you know, kind of to piggyback up on, on what Beth was saying, really fast. I know we're, we're totally going to go over time, you guys. I'm so sorry. We're, we're going to try here not to, but, um, you know, we don't get all of the perks that we are an army museum, but we don't get the same sort of perks that, uh, that, that Beth does as being a direct Navy museum, uh, since we're technically national guard, I should say. And so my staff, I have a staff of three, but this is the first time in six years that, the, that there has been more than one staff member at my museum. And so just to kind of put that into perspective for all of you that, you know, we can only do what's within our means. And uh, we don't have a collections policy, for example. And while I am here saying how important a policy is, it's something I'm continuously trying to work on. But I'm, what I am doing is I'm implementing procedures that will become part of that policy when the policy is complete. And so, um, so this, this is a very apt slide because this has happened multiple times. People will come to the museum and yes, they literally have grenades in their pockets and they're like, hey, I wanna donate this to you. And um, because we have implemented procedures, we now have a donation offer form, for example, that uh, has to be completed before we take anything in. And, and uh, the form comes in, it goes to the collections committee, the collections committee makes the determination on the object and then the object can then be um, brought into us. If, for example, it is a grenade, then along with the object, we have to have proof of um, of certified uh, certification that it's. Unnerded and um, documenting the normal provenance for an object. Um, but that that document has really saved our behinds multiple times because we can easily turn people away and say, you know, this is not part of the policy. Uh, I need you to submit the paperwork first and then we will be back to you. And of course, too, you have to follow your gut and uh, do what makes you feel comfortable. I'm OK with turning people away with with uh, grenades in their pocket, you know, that they have they have had it in their house. They have driven to my museum with it. But I do make sure to leave or to leave them with the information that they need in order to kind of follow that next step. So I will give them contact information for um, for the police station or for the explosive ordinance disposal team, uh, so that they can do their due diligence prior to us becoming involved with them. If anything larger than this is so stupid to say that, but if it's something larger than a grenade and it's something that looks a little bit more menacing or, you know, with my experience, I can, I can kind of determine if, you know, this is something that really should not be moved anymore, then um, I will instruct somebody to, to leave the item in a, in a particular area in our building that I know is safe to house such a thing, and then we will call in EOD for them. And that, that's really only happened twice um, that I'm aware of. But, uh, but, but again, you, you always have to assume that, that the thing is live, that it's active. And uh, so you need to have those procedures and policies in place so that you can mitigate that hazard. Um, 
Let's see here. Sorry, I lost track of my notes because I just like to go. Okay, so Beth and I, of course, are very familiar with who we do get to call. And again, each state is very different, but Beth will cover more on the next slide of, of kind of what your next procedure is after um, interacting with a potential donor. So as Kathleen just said, I'm very lucky. I work directly for the Navy. We are Navy civilians. We are run and budgeted by the Navy. I do have EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal staff on our local base who I can call. I have them saved in my Outlook contacts and they're great guys. They love coming out to the museum. Everyone who has ever come out to work with us on a project, it's been probably the best day of their year. It's, I normally say the best day of their week be, to be for certain, but these are individuals who are trained to handle explosives. They come with experience in handling all different types of explosives, as well as databases of amazing material that can help them identify what parts of an object would be hazardous and what we have to look out for. So the first choice of someone who you should call is an explosive ordnance disposal technician. If you don't have someone in your existing contacts for EOD, but you have a military base nearby, reach out to them because all the, the sections of the military have EOD. So National Guard can work with Army. There's tons of Army bases, lots of Army EOD technicians. There's Marine Corps EOD technicians that are amazing to work with. Navy EOD technicians who I work closely with. Um, Air Force EOD technicians. Uh, all of these organizations that have weapons have to make sure that they can face a weapon. Um, if you don't have military bases nearby, as Kathleen said, police are a really great resource. They're also accustomed and trained to deal with hazardous materials. One of the things with both EOD and police uh, is that you might have to advocate for your artifact. So if something is really important such that the risk of keeping it, even though you don't know that it's safe, is high, uh, is the, the risk of keeping it is worth it, even though you don't know and could have a high risk, be ready to make that fight because most of these technicians, they're whether it's EOD or, or police officers, their SOP, their standard operating procedure is to destroy it. That's what they're trained to do. So if something is significant, you have to say, this is significant and there are people out there that can inspect this and let us know if it's safe. And there are fewer, but there are folks out there that can actually render this safe, render it inert. When it comes to weapons, you, your best resource is going to be the fire authority, firearm authorities in your state because they're going to know the specific regulations for where you are. If you are on federal property, you're going to also have to follow additional regulations there. But a good place to start would be ATF in your area. Um, and we'll pull some of that information up later. But another person to have on hand is a hazmat expert, someone who you can call to handle other different types of hazmat. This is just something that is a great uh, person to have in your emergency plan. But then you also see that on the bottom here, we put state military museums and relevant national museums. And we didn't just put that because we work for state military and national museums that have weapons, but government uh, bodies have different abilities to collect and retain and take, take possession of weapons from private nonprofits. So there may be a situation where you cannot take custody of something but where a state military museum or, or a national museum with a relevant collection would be able to take custody of it and preserve that or be able to help you with advice and figuring out the laws and what it would take and getting you in contact with the appropriate people. We're all working at this together. This type of history is being preserved because it's important and we wanna support all museums in working towards this. And I was gonna mention this on a, coming up on a, on a future slide here, but uh, if you are not in the state of Oregon, always feel free to reach out to me or to the or, or to Oregon's EOD team because they have been specially trained by museum personnel in, uh, in matters of, of 
of heritage and, and preservation. And so they do understand the importance of, of not necessarily necessarily exploding everything or, or removing everything, that they will do their best to, to keep something intact. And, and they're fully aware of you know, what we do and, and the importance of keeping things um, as historically accurate as possible and authentic. So, uh, so again, never, reach, never hesitate to reach out. Uh, so when considering potential acquisitions, uh, let's say that you've already determined that you you want to take this thing in, um, but you really need to talk about, do you need it? It might be a relic that's really cool. It might um, be something that would bring a lot of audience to your facility, but, but just like anything else, don't make a special exception because of that. Really have a conversation about if you need it and if you're the best place for it and if you can house it properly. Uh, as we keep saying, make sure that it's inerted before it comes to you and that all of the documentation comes along with it to support it. Uh, Camp Withicum, I'm on a military base, so you are not allowed to have uh, firearms in your vehicle. And so if you show up to my museum with a firearm, uh, you've technically done something illegal. I mean, I will still let you in and we will have a conversation, but you, um, if, that, if you were to be caught, you would be arrested. And are we and and I guess just bottom line here is really think think about if you're the best place. You know, we had a piece that central photograph actually is is where I'm going here. We had a piece of a uranium from the Manhattan Project. And while that is a significant Pacific Northwest story that we certainly can tell, uh, we don't need uranium in our museum. So that was removed to um, to a facility that could could more properly handle it. So if you do recognize that it is something of historical significance, but you also recognize that you should not be taking it in, then uh, definitely reach out to other institutions that might be interested so you can find proper, proper housing and or disposal for it. Okay. So sometimes the potential ordinance is going to walk in as a grenade in the pocket, or sometimes it's going to be a swimmer launch charge. This was basically designed as this was a prototype design for a torpedo that could be launched by a Navy SEAL. So while swimming, um, it is a prototype. It was not a successful prototype, but when it was offered to our organization, we thought this was really a really interesting development of torpedo technology. It fits our mission really well, um, but it is an ordnance shape. And the person telling us that it was not live was someone who had had it in his garage for a few decades since the project ended and they were told to put it in the dumpster. This was in a private citizen's home in Maryland and we had to figure out a way to make sure that it was safe before it could possibly come across the country, across many state lines um, and then into our museum where it could add other risk. So even though this was never known to be charged, we still had to take those same steps. And so what we did for this one is we actually were able to work with the Marine Corps EOD at Quantico, uh, and they went out and inspected the object in the citizen's home, uh, in our donor's home. And the reason that you can see in this photo that they took it apart here is actually because since it was a prototype, there were no known records of how everything went together. So that amazing database of information EOD can bring with them. For this one, they actually had to, in addition to x-raying it, visually take it apart and look at it to make sure that it was safe uh, since they, they didn't have anything to go from with it. After that inspection, then they were we were able to get it shipped, created up, shipped, and come across state lines. But before we were doing that, we made sure that we had that certification. We knew it was safe. We kept that certification with, uh, with the object and it was sent to me in Washington ahead of time to know that what was coming into our collection was okay to do so. Um, I did put a reminder that this takes time and money, so time is obvious, but if EOD is local to you, they're just doing their job normally in coming out. But if they have to travel, a lot of times you will have to figure out how that travel is being funded and that is a cost of making sure something is safe versus the disposal route that your local police or fire department might be able to handle. 
And the age old, uh, it's really old, so it should be fine. Uh, quote, uh, I feel is greatly personified in these two civil war mines that were in someone's garage and were donated to our museum. So yeah, they're really old. We've had them forever. It's not a problem. Definitely remember that explosives become less stable over time, uh, many types of them, and that moisture can affect the stability of, of explosives, especially if you live in our climate in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but if you don't know that something is safe, you don't know that it's safe. And that's the final line. So until you've had someone look at it, it's not fine. It does not matter the age. You have to consider this as a potential explosive. Okay, so we keep using this term inert. Uh, on the screen, you'll see the definition from the Oxford English Dictionary. But basically, it's just making something inoperable. If it is inoperable, it is inert. Um, and it is applicable to all former ordnance, and that includes missiles, mines, grenades, fuses, projectiles, torpedoes, bullets, small arms, pistols, which is a, which are small arms, uh, barrel assemblies, magazines, and clips. So it's the full range of weaponry here that we are dealing with. Um, and so what actually needs to happen in order to certify something inert? Next slide. So bef before we get to what happens to, before we certify something, uh, in order to certify something in our, um, we are talking about certifying these things as inert or inoperable for objects across different types. But there is actually a uh, legal requirement that excludes uh, things that were designed, fabricated as cutaways, you know, when sections are missing, or if they're designed as what's called a shape, which essentially means a, a dummy object and manufactured to be inert. But I've got a few examples here for us to consider just, you know, what we're really looking at, because this is a cutaway. Yes, it's a cutaway of a Mark 13 torpedo warhead. It's pretty obvious one would think that this is safe, but uh, this was a this was an explosive item that was altered to become a cutaway. So when you have something that was not fabricated as an inert object, it still has to be certified inert. And there can be residues, there could be other uh, potentially damaging items. So it's really important to say, you know, I don't know how this was manufactured. If it was manufactured to be inert, I'm going to get someone who's a specialist to look at it because if it's not, if it was transitioned from something that was once live, then it does have that requirement to be certified. This one you could look at. This is um, a cutaway torpedo. It's got these nice plex sections over it. It's pretty cool. It's got these numbers uh, that are showing educational components. It's a, it's a great educational piece, right? This was clearly manufactured inert, obviously. You would think. But do you know that? So just tracking back to these comments of like, if you don't know the history of something, then you don't know it. And it is not your, you do not have the authority to say that this was totally safe if you don't know the whole history of the object. One of my favorite things is objects that have stencil items on it where it's like training mine only or inert. So yeah, of course, it's just fine, right? Someone has said this is inert, but you also could go buy a set of stencils and a can of spray paint and paint inert on anything. So unless you know the who, what, when, where, and why of how this was certified, you can't rely on that information. Simil similarly, you might think, oh, this is a torpedo stuck into the fake quicksand that was designed as a museum prop. But 
because we didn't have records of it being designed solely as a museum prop and it could have been rendered from an original object, we did actually have this inspected and certified inert because that is the best process for making sure that we're taking care of our collection. And then a fun note about uh, certifying things inert, and we'll get into a little bit more detail uh, shortly, is you know what information you need to say that something is inert. So this object has three stickers that say it's inert. One of the numbers is even engraved, stamped into the object's body. But because we didn't have the right documentation and the people who certified this could not reproduce the documentation up to current standards, we actually had to recertify this object inert. And then to bring home the message from the prior Confederate torpedo, uh, Confederate mines, we have another Confederate mine on the right. It has no fuse. You'd think it doesn't have a fuse, it can't explode, but there could still be explosive residue within the canister. So it was a really easy one to certify inert, but definitely something we still did go through the process. And the one on the left, uh, those are two sections of a 19th century US torpedo. And yeah, it's that same, it's really old. You don't need to certify that inert. It doesn't even have the nose section. We only have the midsection and the after body there. But the reality is because you don't know, and this has been under, this was recovered from an underwater uh, location after 130 years. If there was something in there and you did not know, you're putting everything at risk. So yes, old things, things missing components, things that are cutaways, things that look like they might have been man made as an education prop. If you do not know that it was always safe, always a uh, safe fit from an ordinance perspective, then you should be having someone look at it. And back to what Beth was saying at the beginning of the presentation that you might have things that you don't know are potential issues. Uh, we have these two models that can actually fire ammunition. So they are considered weapons and have to be treated as such. Uh, so yeah, you just never know what might be in your collection. Next slide. Okay, so now to the slide that I was referring to earlier, how do you certify something that's inert or something inert? And again, this is only something that EOD can do and they will do it via x-ray or via visual inspection. And when it is completed, they will provide you documentation that, uh, that backs up that data and provides that paper trail for you to include in your accession file folders. Uh, that documentation will include a description of the object and uh, have an account of either its serial number or its accession number, preferably both on that paperwork. Um, and for those of you who, just in case I uh, don't understand what a, a serial number is, you'll usually see these on um, on ordinance on small arms, and it'll be it, it, it's usually um, a, a precursor is an SN capital letters SN colon, and then a number will follow it, and that's its serial number, and it's a unique identifier um, only for that piece, and it it lives with that item for its its for perpetuity, um, and and we'll talk a little bit more how that comes into play with inventory and um, and care, but again going back to the documentation, it will include that that identifier on it, as well as your accession number. Um, it will also include its inert serial number, which Beth showed us in those images with her stickers. It'll also include the certifier's name and their signature, as well as the date that the inspection was completed. And it will identify how they completed the certification. And then of course, the general location of where the item is located at your facility. Uh oh, what happened to our slides? It looks like we lost Beth for a moment. Just one. Oh no. Everyone, while we get her back. So I'll just kind of go more in depth with what uh, Beth was sharing at the beginning um, related to not everybody can do an inertion or make something inert and uh, not everything can be saved. And so 
we actually had something in our collection that when we, we went through one of the surveys, they had to explode it, but it was historically significant to us. So we asked to, um, to maintain the shrapnel so that we could use that as our educational component. And so now it has an even deeper story because it not only represents its historical value, of course, but it reflects this process that the National Guard EOD team takes part in and that we had to take part in by having an explosive device in our collection. But this definitely goes back to, you know, Beth talking about advocating for your collection. Uh, as a National Guard Museum, we have a lot of exception to policy and every historical institution should as well, but safety always becomes first. But uh, definitely make that, be an advocate for your collection no matter what. Now that Beth is back, uh, why don't we go on to the next slide? Sorry about that hasn't happened in all the ones I posted until the one I'm speaking. Uh, so let's talk about documenting inert status. And I hope I'm not going to repeat something that Kathleen just said, but um, we document things in a multitude of ways. So uh, museum best practice comes into play here. That information that EOD is providing to us in the inert certificate is critical. Like I mentioned in the photos before, I have objects with three inert stickers, but if I don't have that certificate that has all the information about the method of certification, who did it, when, etc., it's worth nothing. And it's just another sticker on my artifact. And I hate stickers as any good collections person, but maybe to an upper level, I really don't like stickers. So I have the artifacts, I have our artifacts stickered because that is a Navy policy. So that's why that is uh, in, in pink down there because Kathleen doesn't have to follow that. But the places that it is important to, to have it as well is in your accession files, your hard copy files, or digital files about the lot, however you're keeping those records, as well as in your database. This material should be searchable and reportable. And then having something on your object label is extremely important because that's going to give people that reassurance at the moment that they're seeing the object. So for me, when I see objects out and about in the world and not our institution, and they are ordinance shapes and may or may not have uh, inert documentation, I kind of look for some sort of documentation somewhere that says it's inert. So if you have objects on display and don't have them stated as inert somewhere, I've, I've probably noticed. A um, little bit of extra credit, duplicate that data everywhere you can. So not only is it in your accession files and in your database, but having an extra copy of all of your inert certificates that are together in one location is really useful for if you need to go somewhere to get that information quickly. And so you should know where that information is for me, it's by my desk. A lot of people, it's also in the collection storage area if all your collections are if potentially hazardous collections are together. Um, but so you have somewhere that you can go and you can reference that information in as many ways as you need to to make it super easy to access. Um, and then also reference where that information, those certificates and the inert safety documentation can be found in your other policies. So if you have weapons procedures, make sure that documentation is included there. Otherwise, it should definitely be in your collections management policy because, you know, from a collections manager perspective, there's a lot of really critical data in our database. And, oh, I'd be so aghast and horrified if I lost any of our data. But if I lose the information about it being safe, there's the potential that someone is going to come in and tell me that we need to explode that artifact. And I don't want someone to explode our artifact. Uh, I also have a note here that this is equally important for radioactive safety. There's also labeling that goes in there for, for that. For us, it is on the tag, but it's not only on the tag, also uh, in the storage area. So people who are not familiar with the objects should make sure that they are not going to encounter radioactive material. So to me, it's one of my favorite things that uh, visitors in our storage area have to walk past a sign that says radioactive material storage as they come in. And I tell them that I won't tell them which objects are the radioactive ones so that they actually don't want to touch anything back there. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> and then um, 
going on after things are in your collection, certified and NER, you have all that great documentation. Just to quickly touch on loans, because we have loans to about 30 different organizations, mostly in the US and one in Australia as well. So an international loan program, mostly focused on torpedoes. And so we are able to lend out torpedoes like we are able to lend out any other object. And there was a question earlier about if there's a difference uh, in the law for items that are certified as inert versus items that might not be. And the reality is once an object has been certified as inert and safe by explosive ordnance disposal technicians, and you have that documentation, and that documentation is current, then you have a three-dimensional object. Now you have a three-dimensional object that you might want to take a little bit of care and thinking about if the borrowing organization is the right place to be putting that object. Um, you might want to make sure that you up your uh, shipping requirements to really make everyone feel like they are safe and comfortable and know that they are shipping an inert torpedo or an inert piece of ordinance. Um, and so for us, when we are shipping out torpedoes, we not only send a copy of the inert certification to the borrowing organization ahead of time, but then we also include it with the object uh, in the crate or on the pallet. And where possible, I also like to brief the driver of the vehicle because normally this is a big shipment that's being arranged for a 2000 pound torpedo. Um, and make sure that the vehicle, the driver knows that this is not a hazard to them. And a great reason for that duplication of data, once again, because shipments get misplaced. It's not what we wanna hear with our artifacts, but you do not want someone confiscating and, dis and destroying your artifact because they don't know that it's safe. So having that duplication of data all over the place is excellent. Um, and there is a really good question in the chat, so I'm going to mention it very quickly here, which is uh, that the documentation is current and it doesn't need to be necessarily re-upped, but it's a good thing to follow the standards, especially for shipping of what classifies as inert documentation, because like those old stickers that I had on a torpedo, those ones, I didn't get the same certificate that is now required that has more information. So it's a good thing to just make sure that your certification meets that current standard. Now I'll turn it back to Kathleen to talk about firearms. Yay. So again, I am a special entity, so I can't speak to full legalities because I have a lot of exceptions to the rule with being affiliated with the National Guard and the Armory and the state of Oregon. So um, the most important thing you can get out of this again, for this section is that you, you basically, you really just need to continue to do your homework. You know, this was step one by coming to our webinar. Connecting to Collections has a, a really great webinar called Lock, Stock and Barrel. And um, it's the the entire, the, the name will be in a, in a future slide too, excuse me. Um, and then next slide. And in that webinar, they'll actually cover these, uh, uh, these four components as well. And so I won't really get into these because um, I do see that we're, we're coming up here on time. And so I wanna make sure that we keep moving forward. But again, the Lock, Stock and Barrel is a really great webinar to review as well. Uh, next slide. So safety is my biggest concern for all of you here today. And um, so when accepting firearms or when dealing with firearms in your collections, uh, it's really important to make sure that nothing is live, obviously. and uh, or, or loaded, excuse me. And I cannot tell you the number of museums and I saw that um, Avery from OSHA has popped into the to the um, webinar today. We in Oregon are actually going through um, this new process with OSHA um, and I'm going to totally butcher what's happening, but, but basically they are now a resource for us in terms of how to um, have safety within our collections. And so they are building a program within our state. And part of that was, you know, Avery's also her, um, identification that there are a lot of weapons in a lot of small museums throughout the state and a lot of people have never looked at them or even know what's going on. And so they very well could be loaded because a lot of weapons do come in loaded to museums. 
And so a really quick and easy trick that you can that you can do is, and it's featured in this this image here, is you can perform a dowel test. And so just go to the hardware store or um, an art store and purchase dowels. Very carefully, put the dowel in through the barrel. Um, mark the the dowel where the barrel where the where it stops in the barrel and pull it out and measure it against the length of the barrel. And if it's shorter than the barrel of the piece, then you most likely have something in your chamber and should contact authorities. Um, hopefully you don't get to this point where you're, where you're doing these quick tests, because again, it should be someone with professional knowledge of how to handle it and how to manage it. But um, this is an easy way, again, being in the reality of a small museum. Um, this is a, a really easy way that you can at least help yourself to, to begin that process. Um, and we've covered everything else. Yeah. Okay. So some additional, some extra credit for best practices are um, removing firing pins and um, firing mechanisms when you can. We can't have anything on display that that is operable. So everything has to be inoperable to be on display. And I think that's just good practice in general, especially if you don't have locked cabinets for your pieces, because people do like to grab things. We have a really, you know, going back to my grenade stories, we have a really great story of um, a patron coming in um, in our old museum when when everything was touchable and pulling a pin out of a grenade and then asking if it was live. And so you you just never know. So <laughs> it's it's crazy. Um, so again, with the with the assumption to handle everything as if it is loaded uh, until you know otherwise, and then create the documentation for for that um, that that process taking place for that verification happening. When you do accept something, always require that you have proof of registration. Um, this will also be a state by state case because you may not be able to take in um, anything even with registration or I, I can actually um, create registration for weapons as um, a special a special military entity. So it is case by case, but you do want to have that that original provenance, which is its registration come along with it. Um, and so that that ownership does transfer to your facility. And again, before you do take anything, just really ask, do you need it? Are you the best institution? Maybe there's a better museum that, that could house it instead of yours. Next slide. When looking to ship firearms, there's so many things that you have to consider. And it, if you go back and you look at those different laws, you'll see that there's different standards of uh, requirements, legal requirements for antique versus modern guns. And it's a lot lower for antique weapons, but modern weapons and machine guns and things that are, are subject to these regulations, they're a lot harder to ship. So if you have a donor who's offering you something or you're looking to lend out a firearm, it is something where you have to really look into the specifics of the laws for that particular situation, because there is no one national law for it. If you're shipping things in state, you're only following the one state's regulation. If you're shipping things out of the state, you're going to have to follow the regulations for every state that you're passing through. So some good uh, standards to have is, you know, always require a signature, always declare what it is, because you need to know that this is, you need people to know what you're dealing with um, and pack it like you would any artifact. You wanna pack it carefully. Um, but adding on to that, the levels beyond the uh, regular artifact shipment levels, if removing that firing pin or the receiver and making the weapon inoperable makes it a lot safer if it were to get into the wrong hands. So thinking about that, this is a weapon and if it is still usable, if it were to go to, to be stolen, be pilfered, someone could do damage, someone could uh, hurt or kill someone, and you don't want your artifact to have that responsibility. But in, and another thing just to remember is that each carrier um, has different regulations for shipping firearms, as well as different airlines if you choose to go a courier route. So, in the end, you're going to have to do some research into the laws and regulations for your state and your carrier um, and go in knowing more than the person at the desk because they probably have never dealt with this. And if you are going to lend out firearms, get in touch with your regional POCs for uh, the ATF. So I've put up the Western region ones here. 
Uh, all of this is available on their website, but most of them have email addresses. It's easy to contact them and keep pushing towards that. I want to know everything about this and make sure that I'm doing it safely. And I will add there too that you're going to get so many different answers too. And so it will require multiple phone calls, multiple conversations with multiple people. Uh, and, and, and then it's, you know, coming to that solution that, that makes the most sense given all the information that you've been given. But uh, do, do put that into account that you're gonna have to take um, extra time in this sort of process because you will get different answers everywhere you turn. Just a heads up on that, unfortunately. And then for storing firearms, it's, it's more simple than you would think. Basically, they need to be in a lockable container in a lockable room that has very limited access. So just it's, you know, collection storage on steroids, really. Um, ideally, if you have a vault, then that is perfect. I would still uh, use something like that center rack that's lockable and have it locked inside of my vault that's then behind another lockable and armed door. But, um, but just the easiest thing that you can do on the cheap is to have um, a lockable um, case like like any of those here um, and they're available through army surplus sometimes for really cheap i have a couple of spare ones if anyone wants one just let me know you'd have to come get it but i have them uh, and then again having that lockable door that no one really knows that that's your firearm storage space and that really you as the collections manager and maybe one other person has access to that space or knows how to get in there and then create your your emergency response plan, of course, for this too. And that that goes not only for disaster, but in case of theft. Um, you know what happens if you do have um, if you do have your collection space uh, broken into. Um, be sure to keep that in your emergency planning as well. Next slide. Goal of thumb is to not work on putting them on display when the public is around. We do not need a room full of people, potentially of any background, when we're handling something that could be a weapon. Even if it's been made inoperable, that same, that threatening potential um, is something that we have to take extra, take into extra consideration when we're putting these items on display. So do this after hours, before hours, days you're closed. That's that's the time we want to be setting up exhibits anyway. And we we don't need to just have people coming over wanting to look closely at our firearms and putting ourselves or other visitors in a potentially scary situation. Um, for both Navy and Army regulations, uh, as Kathleen said, we have to render the weapon inoperable before putting it on display. And it has to be displayed in a case with the locking with either lock with locking hardware and either break resistant glass or plexiglass. And these are just extra uh, steps to increase the security of our of our collections that have this higher risk. The Navy takes it many, many, many steps further. And every firearm that is on display, every small arm, um, not deck guns, but something that someone could carry off, has to be visually checked every two hours while the museum is open. And so this is just an extra level of security to ensure that we know exactly where every collection uh, item that is a weapon is that could be accessible to the public. Army takes a slightly less, uh, but still very uh, diligent with a weekly barrel count of those items on display. So if something goes missing, the point of this is that we wanna know as soon as is possible. Okay, and then for inventory inspection, in addition to what Beth just shared, is that we also have regular inventories that need to be um, completed. For the Army, we do it on a quarterly basis for all items. So yes, that means I am inventorying about a thousand pieces every four months, every three months, because I can't do math. Um, and then documentation has to be submitted to Big Army uh, indicating that we've done this. And then every year, we also have to have um, a non-official individual complete the inspection or the inventory with us as well. Uh, so that we also, we have this continuous cycle of different people completing the, quor the quarterly inventory so that there is sort of um, a more broad oversight, if you will. The Navy on the other hand gets to do an annual firearm inventory. Um, 
But if you're Beth, then you just kind of sit back and you say, no, I'm not going to take any firearms. And so therefore we don't have to do this business. So um, is there anything you want to add on, on your component there, Beth? Actually have to report anytime we add or subtract a firearm from our, from our Navy collection to the people who are responsible for the Navy's firearms generally. Um, and so just how important it is to know exactly what you have and think about why we're keeping these firearms and um, going forward from there. That is with regard to firearms, with uh, our ordinance collection, which we have a large one of. Uh, we do an annual explosive safety inspection. So one year it's an in-person inspection by Navy explosive safety inspectors who come and they are looking at my records. They are looking at our objects. They are doing spot inspections to make sure that I can show them where it's marked on the object and the certification that I have in the binder or on, on our database. Um, the other year, I'm expected to do my own self study of self inspection. So we're always keeping this current and being aware of what's in our collection. And then with thinking about what's in our collection, sometimes we also do want to remove things from our collection. And when we think about deaccessioning of firearms, and ordinance, it just leads to an extra emphasis on thinking about, do you really need to take this item in, in the first place? So when you're going to get rid of it, then there's a few extra hoops to jump through based off of whether it's ordinance or firearm, and it's going to be that much more difficult going forward. So with ordinance, like I said, once it's confirmed as inert, it is kind of a three-dimensional object but if I'm passing that responsibility to another organization, I have to be certain that it is meeting those current guidelines for uh, in our certification. So some things in our collection we've had to recertify, um, not specifically for deaccessioning, but for finding those old ones that didn't have the certificate. Um, and then we have to ensure that we're transferring that documentation as well. Because in the end, if you transfer a torpedo and then nobody knows if it's safe, you might wind up losing that her bit of heritage, even though the person you're transferring it to may be a better home for displaying it uh, long term. With firearms, once again, you're, you're going to have to confirm that safety and the registration and that the person who is receiving it can legally receive it. Uh, so with uh, it is so situationally dependent you can contact those local ATF departments or reach out to military museums like, like Kathleen who have that ability to sometimes accept the accession firearms from museums and create that registration. So there's some really great resources to go use. Them. Okay, and this thing that we keep harping on, starting with a good policy, coming from the person who doesn't have a policy yet, at the very minimum, yeah, I know, laugh at me, Stephanie, thank you. Uh, <laughs> at the very minimum, just begin your procedures um, because those procedures will lead you to writing your policy, but that policy fundamentally is going to help you. We all know that as collections personnel, that uh, the policy is your driver for everything related to what you do. So um, chip away at it and and make it as uh, cohesive as you can. and and by by doing that too you are you are not allowing any gray areas or loopholes for when these special components do pop up in front of you um so do do be as inclusive as you can with that policy just in case something strange comes around uh for the next part you know do do what you think is the most achievable for you. So again, we have, you know, as a, as a National Guard Museum, that's part of the Army Museum Enterprise, we have the, the Army's collections management policy that we can fall back on. We have all of the regulations that, that we have to abide by that, um, that are provided to us for collections and for uh, weapons display and storage. And so utilize those. And, and help that build your standard and, and think about it in terms of what can I do in the next five years? What can we achieve in the next 10 years? And so your collections policy might be very bare bones in the beginning, but at least you're starting it and you're, you're doing something that is achievable with who you have on hand right now. And always ask questions. I think this is one thing that I talk about in every presentation that I've ever given that 
we are such a welcoming committee or community as collections managers that you should be able to reach out to any institution and ask for assistance or ask for resources and they will provide that information to you so never hesitate to cold call or cold email anybody to get that to get that ball started if, if someone isn't responding to you then you know what they're not part of our community because they should be responding to you that is part of our due diligence and our good practice as collections professionals so never hesitate next slide the blurb from bullets to ballistic missiles. Well, the object that's in the back of this photo is actually the payload section of a trainer ballistic missile that's on display at our institution. So I would recommend being very cautious about wanting to collect anything that um, is a, of a nuclear shape because there are huge extra steps that you might find yourself uh, dealing with if you're going down that route. Uh, if it could be subject to the star treaties and other international treaties about nuclear weapons, which might sound far-fetched, but there are several museums in our country that do have to follow those policies because they have complete nuclear shapes. And we're lucky that ours is split into several pieces. So it doesn't fall under that. Um, just to go back to this information from the beginning. If you have an emergency situation, call EOD, call your state police, call your fire department. These are the people that are trained to handle these types of situations. And as Kathleen just said, if it's not an emergency, if you're looking for resources, you're building your policy, call one of us. Call the people in your community who can help you get this information. And really fast too, that um, if you're not in the state of Oregon, don't hesitate to have whichever team you are is, is responding to your institution for your request. Don't hesitate to have them contact the Oregon EOD team, because again, they've been trained by museum personnel and they are, um, you know, especially I keep using the word trained, but they are ready to handle these things and ready to answer your questions and know how to carefully take care of heritage and help you preserve that item. So, so make them reach out to the Oregon EOD. Don't hesitate to do that. Oh, this is a green slide. Hello. So again, here's the resources page that we've developed for you. Again, that lock, stock and barrel um, webinar that, that is available from the Connecting to Collections. And then Beth and I have also listed our, um, our, our military regs that we have to abide by. I think Beth stated yours isn't totally available to the public. Um, I'll let you elaborate. Okay. Multiple regulations, but this one deals specifically with inert ordinance in non, uh, in, in display situations, but Unfortunately, there are some others that are not cleared for the public. Perfect. And then the two that I have listed, uh, AR 870-20 is the main regulation that, that I have to follow. And within it, there are multiple regulations that are referenced. Uh, but the AR 190-11 is a regulation specifically related to displaying and um, storing firearms. So I thought I'd Kind of pull that out one that one out specifically and both of these are available online you may find two versions of ar870-20 the newest version is from 2022 so that would be the version that you'd want to read because the other one is so deep it's not even funny uh and then let's i know for the state of oregon it will become one and we will actually have or i will i'm not part of osha osha will actually start to have uh training sessions and um, and uh, workshops related to their findings and, and, and for having more assistance for museums. And then again, there are just state by state resources. So utilize those people. Um, but again, keep in mind that with weapons, with ordinance, there could be politics at play and you need to talk to as many people as you can so that you can develop what makes you most comfortable and what makes you feel best as a collections professional. Um, I know that I have come across that a lot uh, with my with my time at the military museum and I'm starting to develop my own policies and procedures because I don't feel that um, the information I'm given is is stringent enough. So it's it's very important that you kind of develop those and, and, and look out to others and have peer review to um, from people like Beth and I if, if that's of interest so. 
Do we have any questions? Um, so I did see one here from Sarah. Um, she said, I've always worked under the practice to have firing pins removed, but at my new job, they feel like it would ruin or take away from the object or weapon to remove them. Any advice? That's an easy question. That's an easy answer. You cannot see if a fire pin, firing pin has been removed. It does nothing to the aesthetic of the object and there is no hesitation that can be made. Um, I guess there's the one hesitation is that sometimes you do have to take the, the weapon apart. So there is um, sort of that, that fear if it's a fragile item that it could be a detriment to the piece. Uh, but generally speaking, you cannot tell if there's a firing pin in or not in an item. So no, ridiculous. <laughs> um, and I actually had a question um, as a collections manager who also despises stickers. Um, I wanted to know when you do have to label something. I, I feel like I already know the answer to this, but generally we choose discrete locations to label objects. Um, is the positioning of the sticker dictated by um, the certification person, or do you kind of have a little bit of leeway about where that inert sticker goes? That's a great question, Stephanie. And so it does depend sometimes on the EOD team that you're working with. So if they have to take it off site and render it inert or do the work somewhere else, they might put the sticker on and then you're stuck with it. Um, but if you form a good relationship with EOD locally, they can work with you. So I look a lot at where the markings are on like our on our torpedoes and what would be facing up or out most likely in the most usable way for display. And then I tend to put things on the underside so that I can find them easily, even when on display. And but the general public isn't going to see it as as easily. If they want to look for it, they can as well. Yeah. And I probably shouldn't be confessing to this, but uh, <laughs> our EOD team will actually hand us the stickers and let us choose where to put them. And so for us, we put them on our, our object labels on our tags. And that's, that's actually one thing that we need to remedy in our museum is that nothing is physically labeled. It just has a tag, which is horrible. And so um, what we will be doing is that we will be adding physical labels to the objects that have their accession number, but then we will be writing in the um, EOD inert number along with that accession number. So it is just one label that we are putting on together. But again, that that um, that backup is that the object's uh, paper label that's attached to it, so. And just an extra comment is also talk with the EOD team that's going to be labeling because if they are the type that are going to be in doing it for you, um, they have different standards of stickers. So the little stickers yeah. that I showed on, that's how we have them now certified are great. They're about one centimeter by two centimeters. They're still stickers. I still dislike them. They're fine. Um, I have seen stickers on objects and you do not want a sticker on a grenade. Um, it's going to render it not displayable. So think about that, have those conversations. And if you're doing like a special project to have a collections review, a lot of times they, they can consider other ways to mark things with you. So make the decisions that are right for your, for your collection. Um, all right, we're gonna get through one or two more just cause we don't wanna keep everyone too much longer. Um, this one is from Angelica. She asks, is there an associated cost to the inert procedures and having people coming in for these necessary services? Do you need to have a budget for it? Kathleen uh, and Oregon EOD have established really good relations with museums. And I know that they've gone out to many museums and certified things at no cost. This is EOD's job. Uh, and, and the same would be for destroying items that are potentially hazardous for your local law enforcement agencies. If EOD needs to travel to come with you, to come to visit your facility, then there might be a cost involved. But if you're in their local area, this is this is their their job. Um, but one thing that you should consider is like where they are might be really convenient, but they also have a regular day job too. So sometimes 
you might have to bring someone in from further away if the people who are close to you have too much operational responsibility. In an emergency, they help, they help though. So in an emergency, they will show up, but in a going through and updating records, you'll have to fit things in. Yeah. And again, just remember too that some police stations, some police departments, they also have an EOD team. So it's uh, always start with your local first and then kind of balloon out from there. And uh, again, follow your gut with how you feel, who is uh, with, the, with the people that you are talking to. I can't stress that enough. Okay, everyone, we are approaching 1230. So we're going to wrap up. I have a few announcements. So before you jump off the call, please stick around. First, I want to thank you so much, Beth and Kathleen, and to all of you for joining us today, asking questions and hopefully bringing some useful tidbits back to your own collections. Uh, before we go, a quick spoiler that our next webinar will be on June 15th at 11 a.m. Pacific, where we'll be discussing the care of trains with Melanie Tran of the California State Railroad Museum. If you have never had to lend out a train or deal with visitors riding your artifact, you're in for a treat with this program. Our CWR is also looking for potential projects to support for CSI Registrars 2023 in Pasadena, California. If your institution is in commuting distance of Pasadena and could benefit from the assistance of a gaggle of registrars descending on one of your projects, reach out to rcwrvicechair at gmail.com with your idea, even if it's not fully fleshed out yet. <clears throat> Interest in hosting a project must be expressed by June 2nd. Finally, I'm putting our speaker's contact information back up here on the screen. If you have ideas for future webinars or further questions about RCWR, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. And as our speakers said, take their work emails and send them questions you might have on weapons collections. You never know when you might need it. We'll post a link in today's recording on our RCWR Facebook page. Please share it with everyone you know. Otherwise, I hope you've enjoyed today's event and we look forward to having you back with us in June.